Okay, so um, welcome to uh, this course on uh, advanced complex analysis. So, um, what we intend to do is to give you a uh, given this course a selection of uh, uh, topics from advanced complex analysis. So, um, so of course we assume that uh, uh, you've already done a first course in complex analysis, basically, you know, uh, covering uh, the notion of an analytic function, uh, and then uh, Cauchy's theorem and then uh, the idea of uh, Taylor series, Laurent series, the idea of singularities and the residue theorem ok. So uh, of course uh, we, we have chosen uh, for the topics to be presented certain uh, uh, important theorems, uh, certain landmark theorems uh, which are usually not uh, uh, stressed upon in a first course in complex analysis and whose proofs are also not all that easy ok. Uh, but they are very uh, interesting theorems and they are of a very geometric nature and that is what we will try to cover. So, um, so the uh, of course, uh, so let me start with uh, 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 what we will be doing in the first uh, few lectures and that is about uh, uh, trying to look at zeros of analytic functions ok. So, basically you know uh, uh, so we, so we are interested in zeros of analytic functions so uh, this is a broad topic for the first few lectures all right and of course there are uh, what what i'm going to do is uh, state some important theorems uh, connect connected with uh, this theme so of course let me uh, first of all remind you uh, and uh, when when we, when i say analytic function i think of a function which is defined on a <coughs> on a domain in the complex plane okay uh, uh, so a domain is an open connected set okay so uh, the fact that it is open means that given every given a point in the set there is a small disk surrounding that point which is contained in that set. So, uh, the fact that uh, set is open is being uh, is the same as uh, saying that uh, the set is a union of disks ok. Uh, and um, of course, you know we always work with open sets because uh, if you want to study the properties of a function at a point especially if you want to take a limit uh, at a point then you should be able to approach that point from all directions. And so, you must have a nice disk surrounding that point where the function is defined so you can actually take the limit ok. So, we always study only functions at points where uh, in a neighborhood of which the function is defined ok and that is the reason why we always study op uh, functions defined on open sets and of course, we also study functions defined on connected sets uh, because uh, I mean if a set is not connected then it falls into two pieces and essentially a function on such a set is. Uh, a different function on each piece ok. So, you can reduce the study of functions to uh, just studying functions on a single piece ok uh, and that is why we always study op uh, functions defined on open connected sets which are domains alright. Now, so uh, we take a, a function defined on a domain in the complex plane and we of course assume the function takes complex values. So, again uh, the, the codomain of the function is uh, is complex numbers and if you uh, remember from the, from the first course in complex analysis uh, there are several ways of trying to uh, define uh, when the function is analytic at a point in the in the domain. So, of course, uh, 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 the the simplest definition is uh, that of uh, and it is the most common definition it is that the function should be differentiable at not only at that point, but in a small disk surrounding that point ok and we also use the word holomorphic function instead of the word analytic function that is common in the literature and uh, and we say a function is holomorphic or analytic on the whole domain if, if it is analytic at every point. Of course, the function being uh, analytic at a point uh, can also be described in several other ways 
uh, one way is the way that I told you that it is differentiable in neighborhood of the point uh, that is the first derivative exists in the neighborhood of the point. Uh, the the, uh, the other way of uh, defining uh, a function to be analytic at a point is uh, saying that the function can be expressed as a convergent power series centered at that point in a small disc surrounding that point and this should ha and if this happens for every point uh, then we could call that function an analytic function. So, so basically there is one definition of analytic function which says that uh, the function is differentiable once uh, in the neighborhood of in, in a small neighborhood of the point there is another definition which says that uh, it is represented by a convergent power series centered at that point and the relationship between these two definitions is that uh, they are equivalent and that is the great thing about complex valued functions uh, because uh, power series if you would have learnt in a first course in complex analysis is infinitely differentiable within uh, its region of convergence the, the region of convergence of a power series is always a is a disc centered at uh, the point and then probably some points of boundary may or may not be included but within uh, uh, the disc the power series always represents an analytic function uh, and not only it is once differentiable it is differentiable infinitely many times. So this is one of the uh, striking features uh, uh, that differentiate uh, real valued differentiable functions and complex valued uh, differentiable functions okay. So uh, if you if you assume a real valued function on, on, on a subset of the real line say on an interval open interval is uh, differentiable throughout the interval there is no reason that other higher derivatives exist in fact there is no even there is no there is no reason even that the derivative is continuous whereas if you assume a complex analytic function of a complex variable on uh, at a point is uh, is differentiable in the neighborhood of the point the amazing thing is that it becomes infinitely differentiable which means all the derivatives of all orders exist and they are all continuous this is the greatness uh, this is the amount of power that uh, that one time differentiability gives you infinite differentiability in the neighborhood okay and that is the characteristic uh, uh, I mean feature of studying uh, analytic functions and of course uh, the the power series if you take the coefficients of the power series they are going to be related to the, uh, the they are going to be related to the Taylor coefficients and uh, these Taylor coefficients can be gotten by uh, using uh, Cauchy integral formula okay. So, so you have this notion of an analytic function uh, uh, either you define it as uh, something that is uh, uh, locally given by a convergent power series or uh, something that is a function that is uh, differentiable uh, everywhere okay differentiable once everywhere. Um, and of course the usual way of checking that a function is uh, is analytic is the uh, is by checking the so called Cauchy Riemann equations. So uh, what you do is that you check the you take the real and imaginary parts of the function uh, this is how you try to check a function is analytic usually you take the real and imaginary parts of the function and then uh, you write down the Cauchy Riemann equations and then you check the Cauchy Riemann equations are satisfied and uh, then you also uh, probably uh, check that the first partial differentials are continuous uh, and then you conclude that the function is analytic. Now so there is a way of checking that a function is analytic using Cauchy Riemann equations as well but nevertheless uh, the point is that uh, 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 we are interested in uh, zeros of analytic functions and uh, the first important fact that uh, all of you should have studied in a first course in complex analysis is that the zeros of an analytic function are isolated okay so that is the first important fact that means given a zero of an analytic function uh, there is always a small disk surrounding that zero where there are no other zeros okay so this is called uh, so if you have different zeros uh, they can be separated from each other by small open disks centered at those dis at those zeros and this is <coughs> uh, this is what we say uh, uh, this is what we say uh, this is what we mean when we say that the zeros are isolated so the zeros of an analytic function are isolated okay um, now you see uh, so then of course the comes the question uh, uh, when you uh, what is the problem with looking at the zero of an analytic function uh, well you take a uh, well you take a function which is 
having a 0 at a certain point which is analytic at that point uh, if you take a small neighborhood you know there is a small neighborhood where there is no other 0 because zeros are isolated now if you invert the function in that uh, uh, disc then you know the 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 uh, reciprocal of the function is defined except for the 0 there okay and uh, then this gives rise to a pole uh, at that point and this is one example of what is called a singularity okay. So analytic functions uh, there are bad there are points on the uh, boundary of the region where the function is analytic uh, where <coughs> the, uh, the analytic functions are supposed to have singularities so there is so called singular points and again you would have studied about singular points in the, in the first course in uh, complex analysis uh, so basically one is always uh, one always worries about uh, uh, so called uh, isolated singularities because one does not want to the, the case of uh, non isolated singularities is, uh, is far more complicated uh, to analyze uh, so for example if you take the function uh, log z uh, then you know uh, it has several branches you have to define various branches of the logarithm but to define a branch of the logarithm you will have to make a slit uh, in the on the plane uh, for example you have to slit the plane along the negative real axis uh, and uh, then you can define a branch of the logarithm and then the the whole negative real axis becomes uh, points of singularity for this function. So uh, this tells you that the singularities are not isolated because uh, they, they are they continuously lie on the negative real axis but of course these are not the kind of singularities we are interested in uh, one always studies uh, isolated singularities and isolated singularities basically are of three types if you recall uh, the first one is uh, uh, called uh, the removable singularity uh, and a removable singularity is essentially the uh, is a is a no sing is, is a non singularity okay a, the, for example a function like sin z over z that is 1 by z times sin z uh, if you look at z equal to 0 uh, uh, if you try to directly substitute in the function you will get 0 by 0 which is a, which is not a defined value but of course you know limit as z tends to 0 sin z by z is 1 so if you define the function to be uh, to take the value 1 at z equal to 0 this gives rise to an analytic function and uh, uh, therefore the point z equal to 0 is what is called a removable singularity for the function f of z is equal to sin z by 1 by z into sin z and how this is reflected is of course it is reflected by uh, looking at the power series expansion if you if you take the power series expansion for sin z and divide that by out by z you see that uh, uh, you essentially do not get any negative powers of z and that tells you that essentially uh, this is a Taylor series so not a Laurent series and therefore this is not really a singularity and therefore and you will also see that if you take the power series for uh, sin z at the origin and divide by z and put z equal to 0 you will get 1 and that will tell you that uh, 1 should be the value that you should define for the function to become analytic at the point at the origin okay. So this is what is called an, uh, 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 an isolated uh, removable singularity then of course uh, come the so called poles of a function and the poles are well uh, they are they are supposed to be thought of as zeros of the denominator okay. So I mean the simplest example is you take uh, if you if you are given a point uh, uh, z0 then you look at the function 1 by z minus z0 to the power of n where n is a positive integer and then you know z uh, z0 is a 0 of z of this function uh, of the denominator of this function which is just z minus z0 to the power of n is a 0 of order n. So 1 by z minus z0 to the n has as a pole of order uh, n at z0 okay. So uh, the pole is basically a 0 of the denominator that is how you should think of it and uh, well um, uh, uh, so a pole is really a singularity uh, it is something that you cannot uh, uh, tinker with to make the function analytic at that point okay and and a, in a way a versor kind of singularity is called an essential singularity and that is a singularity uh, uh, of the f uh, in the f uh, uh, for example you take e power you take exponential of 1 by z at z equal to 0 that is an essential singularity and uh, both poles and essential singularities are really the bona fide singularities the removable singularities are actually non singularities because uh, you can always uh, 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 get rid of them you can get rid of removable singularities by redefining the function at the point but you cannot get rid of a pole or an essential singularity uh, at a given point okay and 
and then of course uh, you would have also learnt how do you uh, distinguish between uh, a pole and an essential singularity and uh, the there is a so called Laurent theorem which is an analogue of the uh, or you may even call it an extension of the Taylor theorem. So the Taylor theorem uh, is a theorem that if a function is analytic at a point then you can express it as a convergent power series around that point that is you can find a convergent power series centered at that point which point wise converges to your given function in a good neighbourhood of the point this is Taylor's theorem and this is the uh, this is the theorem that actually tells you that once differentiability uh, implies infinite differentiability this is what gives you the equivalence of the, the seemingly weaker definition of analyticity being once differentiable and the stronger definition of uh, and the stronger uh, you know uh, implication that uh, uh, once differentiable implies infinitely infinitely many times differentiable so that is the Taylor theorem but uh, the Laurent the Laurent theorem is uh, uh, a kind of extension of the Taylor theorem it tells you that if you also include negative powers then you can get a series involving also negative powers uh, in a deleted neighbourhood of the point and that is called the Laurent series and uh, uh, for all you know the Laurent series may have uh, negative powers uh, of arbitrary order okay. So, uh, you know so if you if you look at uh, if you if, if z equal to z naught is an uh, well isolated singularity of f of z uh, of course I am assuming f is an analytic function and z naught is a singular point it is an isolated singularity uh, then then uh, uh, we have a not we have we have a Laurent expansion so well uh, uh, f of z is equal to well let me write it like this a naught plus a 1 z minus z naught plus a 2 z minus z naught squared and so on this is the this is what is called the the analytic part of the Laurent expansion and then you get the negative powers you get a minus 1 by z minus z naught then you get a minus 2 by so this is a subscript minus 1 it is not a minus 1 okay and this is a subscript minus 2 z minus z naught squared and so on. So uh, uh, this is called a Laurent series centered at z naught and the function converges to this uh, this equality means that this Laurent series converges uh, if you plug in a value of z uh, in in a small disk surrounding z naught uh, then this series converges to a value which is equal to the function value at the at that point and uh, and of course the 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 point should not be z naught because you cannot substitute z naught here because you will be dividing by zero on all these negative terms and uh, the fact and the fact that if z equal to z naught is a is a removable singularity then all these negative coefficients will be zero so your Laurent expansion will actually be a Taylor expansion that is exactly what happens when you look at 1 by z times sin z for example at z equal to 0 okay and okay so uh, uh, this is a so called Laurent expansion and uh, the point is that uh, among uh, the important singularities namely the poles and the and the essential singularities uh, you can also distinguish uh, the type of singularity by looking at the at the uh, Laurent expansion if you get infinitely many uh, of these negative powers okay then uh, the singularity is an isolated essential singularity uh, for example exponential of 1 by z at z equal to 0 and if you get only finitely many of these negative terms then it is a pole okay uh, and the order of the pole will be equal to the uh, the minus of the uh, uh, largest negative subscript you get here okay uh, so that is another that is one way of uh, you know trying to distinguish between a pole and uh, an essential singularity there is there is one more way of distinguishing between a pole and an essential singularity and that is by taking limits okay if you take uh, the limit of the function as the point tends to the singularity and if the limit uh, exists and is equal to infinity from all directions so uh, of course this means that you have to make sense of what 
uh, limit equal to infinity means I mean uh, the limit of a complex quantity uh, you say it, it is equal to infinity if the modulus of the quantity becomes arbitrarily large okay no matter how you approach the limiting point. So uh, you know if the singularity z0 is such that as z tends to z0 in no matter in whatever direction the mod of f of z goes to infinity then you say uh, uh, the limit of f of z as z tends to z0 is infinity and this is the situation exactly when z0 is a pole okay and if uh, the, the there could be and what happens in the case of an essential singularity the limit will not exist in the sense that you might get limits different li limits as you approach in different directions for example you can take exponential of 1 by z and try to uh, calculate the limit from uh, by approaching uh, the point z equal to 0 from the positive axis from the negative axis uh, real axis positive real axis you will see you will get different values the fact the, mo the fact that you get different values from different directions tells you the limit does not exist and that is precisely the, the that is precisely the condition that tells you that it is an essential singularity okay. So uh, so the most important thing about uh, singularities is uh, what is called the the residue of the uh, the residue of the function uh, at, at an isolated uh, at an isolated singularity and uh, that is supposed to be uh, the value of this uh, 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 this coefficient a sub minus 1 which is the coefficient of uh, 1 by z minus z0 okay. So you know residue of f of z at z equal to z0 uh, is a minus 1 okay and this is a very very important uh, 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 value for the function uh, because uh, the because it is connected with the residue theorem okay. Uh, which tells you that this is what you will this is what you will get if you uh, if you try to integrate if you integrate the function over a curve surrounding over a simple over a closed curve that surrounds this point uh, a simple for example a circle a circular arc uh, a, a, a circle that surrounds this point if you integrate the function what you will get is 2 pi i times uh, 2 pi i times this uh, this quantity. So for example you know uh, you know you can take a very very simple example take g of z to be uh, 1 by z minus z0 I mean this is the simplest thing you can think of okay and you well here is z0 on the complex plane and then if you want draw a circle uh, look at the circle mod z minus z0 is equal to rho is the circle and uh, obviously this is an analytic function except for the point z equal to z0 everywhere else it, the denominator never vanishes z0 is a 0 of order 1 so it is a simple pole okay a pole of order 1 is called a simple pole and if it is order is greater than 1 it is called a multiple pole and well if you try to integrate if you calculate 1 by 2 pi i integral over if I call this circle as gamma uh, uh, f uh, of, of g z I will end up with uh, I will end up with 1 okay so in fact you know if I if you want I can even put a lambda here where lambda is uh, uh, any complex number okay and if I integrate it what I will end up with is well if you uh, if you, you would have done this several times uh, so if you want to integrate over a contour <coughs> the method is that you first parameterize that contour and then you make a change of variable mind you whenever you integrate something uh, when you integrate a function over a contour you must understand that the variable lies on the contour okay so that means that you should write an equation for the contour and that is called the parameterization of the contour. So the parameterization of this contour is z equal to z0 plus rho e to the i theta where theta varies from 0 to 2 pi so this integral becomes well if you, if you write it down uh, perhaps you already done it. Uh, you certainly have done it but let me just recall quickly you you will just get lambda so you will you will get 1 by 2 pi i integral theta from 0 to 2 pi <coughs> I am going to get uh, uh, g of uh, z is z0 plus rho e to the i theta uh, uh, 
uh, of course I forgotten to write uh, dz there which is the variable of integration okay. So I will get d d uh, z0 plus <coughs> rho e to the i theta and this this will turn out to be 1 by 2 pi i integral 0 to 2 pi what you will get here is 1 by uh, z minus z0 if I substitute this I will get rho e to the i theta <coughs> and if I differentiate this I will get uh, i uh, rho e to the i theta d theta okay and what will I end up with I will end up with well, uh, well my rho to the e i theta cancels my i cancels so I get 1 by 2 pi i integral 0 to 2 pi I think I forgot a lambda there so there is a lambda on top. So I will get lambda d theta and that is just flat <coughs> okay. So, uh, so the moral of the story is that you see if I look at this function and integrate it over a small uh, over this small circle surrounding this uh, uh, <coughs> this uh, this point which is a simple pole I pick up this 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 coefficient and you know actually about this point if you try to uh, write the Laurent expansion this is the Laurent expansion the Laurent expansion for lambda by z minus z0 is lambda by z minus z0 okay it is already the Laurent expansion and a minus 1 is the coefficient of 1 by z minus z0 and that is lambda and that is what shows up when you calculate 1 by 2 pi i and that is a residue for the function. So this is this is a, a simplest uh, illustration of uh, the philosophy behind the residue theorem <coughs> the residue theorem says that uh, if you integrate uh, over a uh, you know the point which is a isolated singularity and uh, assume that there are no other singularities <coughs> then what you will get is the residue at of the you will get uh, uh, I mean 1 by 2 pi so let me write that so to be more precise you have the residue theorem which is the uh, uh, residue theorem is a starting point at least for uh, uh, our discussion. So you know so basically you have uh, uh, let us assume that you have a nice uh, contour uh, like this and you have a function <coughs> f defined on this uh, uh, on this on, on a on a domain which contains this contour and the interior of the contour and assume that you know there are <coughs> there are uh, well. Uh, several isolated singularities z1 z2 and so on uh, zn if you integrate the function if you write 1 by 2 pi i integral over uh, this contour of uh, fz dz what you will get is uh, uh, some summation uh, i equal to 1 to n residue of f of z and z r this is the residue theorem. <coughs> so what I have done here is I have taken uh, I have simply taken uh, the function to have only one singularity isolated singularity and I, I do this integration and what I end up is the residue at that point but if you have several and of course you should assume that there are no there are no uh, singularities on the on the contour over which you are integrating okay. So you know uh, the assumption for this is that the function is analytic in the interior <coughs> and also on the boundary which means that uh, to say the function is analytic on the boundary means actually it means that it is analytic in a small disk surrounding every point on the boundary which means it is actually analytic in an in a bigger open set a bigger domain which actually contains this boundary and the interior okay. So uh, then this is the so called residue theorem and uh, in the simplest case it reduces to this and you can also see that you know uh, if you if you take this function and you uh, instead of taking lambda by z minus z0 suppose I took this power series I mean if I not power series if I take this Lorentz series and I integrate it okay around a contour like this uh, then of course you, uh, uh, the first thing is that the integral of this whole series is the same as integrating term by term that is you can integrate term by term and then take the resulting series and this is po this is correct because uh, you can in interchange integration and summation provided the series of functions 
converges uniformly okay and uh, it is a theorem uh, 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 that if you take a Laurent series then within uh, in, the, in the region where the Laurent series is defined if you take a closed disc <coughs> in that region then the Laurent series will converge uniformly okay and of course whenever I say Laurent series should should be it should be a deleted uh, neighborhood uh, you should not include the point of course because you cannot substitute the point because you will be dividing by 0 for the negative terms but uh, but of course uh, th there is a similar theorem for power series which says that whenever you have a power series uh, which is converging in a uh, in a disc then <coughs> if you take any uh, closed disc inside that disc the power series will converge there uh, uh, in fact you absolutely and uniformly okay. So, uh, so because of this uniform convergence the integral if I calculate this integral for this function I can actually integrate term by term and you know if I integrate term by term from here onwards each term will give me 0 because it is Cauchy's theorem Cauchy's theorem says that if you integrate a analytic function uh, over a simply closed curve there is uh, the uh, I mean the, the integral is going to vanish you are not going to get anything okay and so uh, the integral of all these terms will go, go away okay uh, the integral of this term will give you a minus 1 of course okay and the integrals of all these terms will also go away because 1 by z minus z0 to the power of uh, for example 1 by z minus z0 the whole square has an antiderivative which is just 1 by minus 1 by z minus z0 to the power of 1 okay. So all these negative terms from power 2 onwards they all have antiderivatives and uh, it is a it is a it is a version of the fundamental theorem of calculus that whenever a function has an antiderivative then uh, the 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 integral is just the antiderivative evaluated at the final point minus the antiderivative evaluated at the at the initial point but then this is a closed curve the final point is the same as the initial point therefore you get 0. So if you integrate this term by term the only thing you will pick up is a minus 1 and that is that is the proof of the residue theorem if you had a single uh, if you had a single uh, singularity okay and then if you have several singularities this follows because uh, of Cauchy's theorem because what Cauchy's theorem will tell you is that Cauchy's theorem tells you basically that if you take an analytic function and integrate uh, it over a simple closed curve uh, the integral is 0 okay but this is the so called simply connected version of uh, Cauchy's theorem which is over a simple closed curve uh, where your domain which means the, the region inside the curve has no holes okay but then there is a new there is a different version of Cauchy's theorem which says that you know if your domain is has an outer curve like this and you have inner curves you have inner curves and of course you know in all these issues uh, 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 the orientation of the curve is very important we always take the curves to be <coughs> uh, oriented in the anti clockwise sense and that is called the positive orientation okay and if you change the orientation the sign of the integral will change that is how it goes uh, and if you if you apply Cauchy's theorem to the region uh, which is this uh, the interior of this curve and the exterior of all these little curves that the function is of course analytic and therefore you will get that the, func the integral is 0 but that will amount to say that the integral over the <coughs> the outer region the outer curve is the sum of the integrals of the inner curves okay and but then sum of each int but each integral uh, will give you the residue at that point as I have explained here <coughs> and therefore you get the residue theorem basically you get the residue theorem from uh, an application of Cauchy's theorem and literally uh, this uh, this kind of argument okay fine so uh, so you have the residue theorem now uh, the uh, you see the the uh, so let me uh, having told you so far let me also tell you uh, what kind of theorems we are going to uh, prove okay uh, I, I, I think uh, I, do, I, can, I, I do not know how many lectures it may take but <coughs> probably a few lectures. So you see the kind of theorems we want to prove are actually theorems about zeros of analytic functions and well so uh, uh, yeah so uh, a glimpse of the uh, you would like to prove so uh, probably uh, some of you who have 
done a little bit of further reading beyond the first course might have seen proofs of these theorems but uh, this is where I would like to start the course. Uh, so the, the first theorem is uh, so called <coughs> uh, 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 argument principle okay and uh, the uh, this is so called argument principle and uh, the the and what is this argument principle so so let me state the theorem that I that I that I, that I want to prove one is the argument principle probably it is just a some kind of a corollary to the residue theorem if you look at the logarithmic integral uh, if you remember it from the first course but anyway I will I will recall it the the second thing is using the argument principle or even otherwise you can prove the so called Roche theorem okay. Uh, then we would like to study uh, we would like to prove Hurwitz theorem um, um, and of course uh, uh, and thereafter one would like to uh, study uh, you know the open mapping theorem prove, prove the open mapping theorem. Uh, um, and of course wa also one would like to prove the inverse function theorem okay. So the uh, these are the I mean the first set of theorems we would like to prove okay uh, probably you would have seen the first and the second maybe but anyway it is uh, they are the starting point so I will make it a point to recall them okay. So let me explain. <coughs> Uh, uh, let me explain what these uh, what these theorems are. So uh, the first one is the argument principle. Uh, so what it uh, so what does so what does it say? Uh, so I'll I'll briefly describe uh, what the statements of these theorems are, and you will see that they are actually connected with. Uh, I mean they are the right theorems that uh, uh, that will come under this topic, uh, trying to study zeros of analytic functions. Okay. Uh, so uh, the argument principle so the argument principle is well you know uh, uh, 1 by 2 pi i integral over a simple closed curve so when I say simple closed curve uh, uh, let me explain what that means first of all a curve is said to be closed if its initial point is the same as a terminal point okay of course uh, by a curve generally we mean the image of uh, an interval a closed interval if you want uh, the closed interval 0 1 on the real line a continuous image of that on the complex plane it is called a curve. For example uh, uh, the, the, the circle is a curve because it is the image of the interval 0 2 pi under this function uh, theta going to uh, if you want z0 plus rho e to the i theta okay. So it is a continuous image of the interval and it is a closed curve if uh, the initial point is the same as the final point the fact that there is an initial point and there is a final point tells you that the curve is already oriented okay that means there is a direction for the curve and that is that direction is given by the direction of the that that is given by the the, the direction of increase of the the parameter the, the variable that is used to write the equation of the curve okay. And uh, and when I say simple curve it means that the curve is does not cross itself does not intersect itself so it is not something like a figure 8 or more complicated curves that cross themselves uh, one segment of the curve uh, twists and turns and come comes back and uh, hits itself at some point again crosses itself okay there are no such self crossings. So such a curve is called a simple curve and uh, since you are going to do uh, since you are going to do integration okay the curves that we we will always deal with uh, will be piecewise smooth that means the curves uh, uh, if you write down the parameters parameterization for the curve okay uh, then the parameterization will always come uh, will be defined over some interval and the fact that uh, you can divide this interval into sub intervals in each of which the function you write down is actually differentiable it is differentiable and continuous. 
So, this is what is called a piecewise smooth curve. So, for example, here the function theta going to z0 plus rho e to the i theta, where theta lies from 0 to 2 pi, is of course a, a continuously differentiable function of theta, which is the parameter, okay. But in more, but more generally, a, a curve uh, need not be uh, given by a single parameterization, it could just break down into several pieces, and each piece may have a different parameterization, okay. One piece may be, say, part of a a circle another piece may be part of a parabola the third piece may be part of a line but it doesn't matter the point is piece wise it has to be it has to be smooth so so whenever i say simple closed contour or when i say whenever i say contour it's always a something that is piece wise smooth okay so the argument principle basically tells you that if you are looking at a function which is a, a, a function defined on a domain like this okay uh, with the property that uh, this the function is analytic on the on this uh, uh, on a on a domain which contains this whole region okay uh, except at finitely many points uh, which lie in the interior which are uh, only poles okay uh, uh, you uh, you assume that they are only poles <coughs> okay and the function should not have uh, uh, the function should not have any zeros on the on the on the boundary of the contour. Okay, then uh, the one by two pi i integral over gamma of d log f z. It's called the logarithmic integral. Okay, which is uh, will give you the number of uh, zeros minus the number of poles inside the inside the region. Okay, so this is the this is basically the argument principle, and and of course. Uh, d log f z of course means d log f z means f dash of z by f z what you must understand is that because f is analytic wherever f is analytic f dash is also analytic because as I told you a function that is analytic is infinitely differentiable. So and this is a quotient of analytic functions it will be analytic there the only problem is the denominator might vanish. So wherever you have zeros of f f dash by f the logarithmic the so called logarithmic derivative of f will have a pole wherever f has a 0 and of course uh, if f has a pole uh, uh, then f dash have a pole okay. So the only poles for this function uh, we assume the only poles for this function are some zeros of f inside the zeros should not lie on the boundary and uh, some poles of f inside and they also uh, should not lie on the boundary. So the boundary should be full free from both zeros and poles and there are only finitely many zeros and poles inside uh, inside the uh, inside your domain okay and uh, so this is the argument principle. So uh, computing the log if you integrate the logarithmic derivative uh, the argument principle tells you that you get the difference between the uh, number of zeros and number of poles. So that is the that is the so called argument principle okay and then <coughs> let me quickly tell you about what these other uh, theorems have to say. So uh, uh, so I am I am uh, just now giving a, an overview of results but then we will go into them more deeply. So what is Roche's theorem? So Roche's theorem is uh, so as I told you uh, uh, this this whole exercise is to uh, somehow uh, 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 study zeros of analytic functions okay and uh, uh, basically for example you want to count the number of zeros in a uh, inside a inside a in a region which is bounded uh, by a let us say a curve a simple closed curve. So uh, the point is that uh, the point is that you do not get uh, uh, in general a 0 of f could be a will of course be a pole for f dash by f. So you cannot avoid considering poles also okay. So that is the reason the argument principle gives you the zeros and the poles also. So in particular if there are no poles <coughs> then you will be counting the number of zeros and of course when you count number of zeros mind you every zero has to be counted with multiplicity. So for example you know if you take the function lambda by z minus z naught this has 0 of order 1 at z naught. Uh, so the number of zeros will be one. If you take a, uh, uh, a simple closed curve enclosing z naught, 
if it is not going to enclose that not the number of zeros will be 0 okay but if I replace this by lambda by z minus z0 to the power of m then the number of uh, zeros will uh, be m though physically there is only one zero at z0 but its order is m so it is also the order of vanishing okay it's I, it is the number of times the factor z minus z0 z minus 0 appears so you whenever you say zeros uh, or poles you have to count them with multiplicity zeros also have to be counted with multi multiplicities for example if i take the function z minus z0 to the power of m where m is positive then z0 is a zero of that function but uh, it's uh, it should be counted as m zeros so zeros and poles have to be counted with multiplicities and then this formula holds so this is the kind of counting principle okay uh, that is one thing then Roche's theorem is uh, something more uh, 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 the philosophy of Roche, Roche's theorem is that you know you take a you take an analytic function in a domain and suppose you are interested in the zeros inside uh, uh, inside the region the domain that is uh, uh, you know uh, that you get uh, in the interior of a simple closed curve okay then Roche's theorem says that you know if you uh, if you perturb the analytic function a little bit okay even after perturbations the number of zeros will not change okay that is if you if you add to the analytic function another analytic function which is which is small enough that means you add to the analytic function a smaller analytic function of course you know there is nothing called smaller or bigger in complex numbers because complex numbers are not ordered but then whenever we say smaller or bigger we always refer to the modulus so you know what Roche's theorem says is that you take a function f of z which is analytic uh, in a <coughs> in say a in, in say a bounded region surrounded by a simple closed curve uh, then the number of zeros will be the same for f of z and f of z plus g z where g z is a smaller function smaller on the boundary okay so that is Roche's theorem and you think of adding g to f as a small perturbation of f okay so so i will just write it in words uh, 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 the number of zeros of zeros is not affected inside in inside <coughs> a uh, simple closed contour is invariant is invariant means it does not change is invariant uh, under small perturbations so you take the analytic function uh, and add to it a smaller analytic function a function that is smaller than this function on the boundary on the boundary contour then even after adding it the number of zeros is not going to change okay so uh, the, the addition of a another analytic function which is dominated by the given analytic function on the boundary is called perturbation if you want okay and it is a small perturbation because what you are adding uh, in modulus is strictly less than the modulus of the given function on the boundary okay so this is this is Roche's theorem right so uh, one version of Roche's theorem will tell you that suppose you want you have two analytic functions f and g okay how can you conclude that they have the same number of zeros okay so the answer to that is uh, you calculate you know if you if you calculate mod of f plus g triangle inequality will always give you mod of f plus g is less than or equal to mod f plus mod g okay now the question is on the boundary if you get strict inequality if you get mod of f plus g is strictly less than mod f plus mod g on the boundary then both f and g will have the same number of zeros inside that is another that is another avatar of this Roche's theorem so it helps you to com also to compare uh, the it tells you that two analytic functions will have same number of zeros if uh, the sum of their moduli do is strictly greater than dominates uh, uh, the modulus of their sum on the boundary okay that is another avatar of this okay so it helps you to compare number of zeros <coughs> then the third one is Hurwitz theorem so this this Hurwitz theorem is again uh, you know uh, 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 it is it is again a very beautiful theorem what it says is that you know if you have if you have a if you have a sequence of 
uh, analytic functions which is converging to a given function okay in a domain and assume that the convergence uh, is going to be uniform on every closed disk in that domain. So this is called uniform convergence on compact subsets okay uh, the other word that is used in the literature is called normal convergence okay. So if you have normal convergence okay which means uniform convergence on compact subsets for example the convergence is uniform on every closed disk in your in your domain. So if this is if this is a normal convergence and and if uh, f has a 0 of order n at z0 then what happens I will draw a diagram so z0 is is a point where the limit function f of z has 0 okay now uh, 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 some fundamental complex analysis will tell you that because the convergence is uniform and since each of these functions is already analytic f will also turn out to be analytic okay uh, that is again an exercise uh, uh, that you can easily try to do and in fact the derivatives of all these will also converge to the derivatives uh, of f okay and all this is just because of this normal convergence uniform convergence over compact subsets and and of course in the in, in that case uh, the integrals will also converge because the moment you have uniform convergence integrals derivatives everything will behave well with respect to limits okay. So uh, so suppose the limit so the limit function will be analytic and if it has a 0 of order n at the point z0 what will happen is you can find a small enough disk surrounding z0 uh, small enough radius such that beyond a certain stage all the fn's they will all if you take each fn it will have a n zeros inside this each fn will have n zeros with multiplicity which means that some of the zeros may be multiple zeros and the beautiful thing is as you if you plot those n zeros okay uh, so I I I I, I was so you know if you plot those n uh, those uh, capital n zeros and uh, if you make this small n become larger and larger then these uh, these various zeros will slowly come they will coalesce they will all tend to the point z0 okay. So what it tells you is that uh, when you take a, uh, a nice limit of analytic functions then the 0 of the limit comes from zeros uh, uh, is a limit of zeros of the same uh, number of zeros of the functions in the sequence okay. So uh, uh, if f has a 0 of order n into z0 then then you know then let me write it out so somewhere here so then there exists a row greater than 0 such that uh, for large n uh, fn has n zeros in mod <coughs> z minus z0 less than rho uh, which con which which <coughs> which converge to z0 as n tends to infinity okay. So what Hurwitz theorem says is that the 0 of the limit comes by you know you take 0 of beyond a certain stage it is the zeros of the functions that are giving the limit zeros of the function that you are taking a limit of it is those zeros that slowly you know coalesce together and give you the 0 of your uh, function okay. So this is uh, this is Hurwitz's theorem and uh, then I uh, will quickly tell you what the open mapping and the inverse function theorems are. Uh, the open mapping theorem is a very beautiful theorem it tells you that uh, if you take uh, an analytic function uh, and you take a point where the function is non 0 I mean the, the derivative of the function is not 0 then uh, uh, there is a neighborhood uh, of that point where the function is an open mapping which means that it will map open sets to open sets and this is a very deep uh, result okay because it is very rarely uh, uh, in topology that you get open maps okay and uh, for example a bijective continuous map need not be a topological isomorphism but if it is bijective continuous and open then it is an homeomorphism because the openness of the map along with the injectivity will tell you that the inverse map is continuous 
so you know so what it tells you is that an open map uh, is uh, as good as an isomorphism except that you need to know that it is injective if you know it is injective then it is an isomorphism okay so you can invert the map and all this is true analytically complex analytically also so the only condition is that you know the derivative should not vanish at a point and then in neighborhood of the point uh, everything is beautiful you it is a local isomorphism okay that is essentially the open mapping theorem and uh, let me quickly tell you about the uh, the inverse function theorem the inverse function theorem is that again uh, uh, in a sense uh, 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 you can you can think of it as another variant of the open mapping theorem what it says is that whenever the derivative is non zero okay at a point then there is a small neighborhood where you can invert the map okay you and and the the inverse function can be written again using a cauchy integral okay there is a there is an integral formula to write out the inverse so you can invert the function there is an explicit formula okay so uh, so the uh, so this is the so i am not i am not uh, writing more details we will go in we will go into them in the succeeding lectures so the point about these two theorems is that uh, you must be essentially looking at uh, 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 well there is a more uh, general version of open mapping theorem we will tell you that uh, all you do not even need the derivative to be non vanishing essentially you need a non constant analytic function okay. So uh, 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 you need a you need a non constant analytic function and it will always map uh, open sets to open sets okay and in particular if the if the if the derivative is non zero then in a neighborhood of that point where the derivative is non zero the function is actually a holomorphic isomorphism it is an analytic isomorphism which means it is an isomorphism it is injective uh, onto its image which is open and if you take the inverse function that is also holomorphic that is also analytic and that is given by a nice formula integral formula that is what uh, the inverse function say, theorem says okay. Now all these are somehow connected with zeros of analytic functions and they can all uh, be derived starting from the argument principle which essentially is uh, uh, I, I should say uh, the residue theorem applied to not to f but it is residue theorem apply applied to the logarithmic derivative of f. So the root for everything is the residue theorem okay uh, so we will do this in the forthcoming lectures okay so uh, let me stop here.